Uh, we are back. Let me make sure this is on. It's on. It's on. It should be on. We are back. Episode three of Traders season two. This was this was an episode. Like the last ten minutes felt like a suspense movie. I don't know if y'all felt that way, but the way I was watching it, the way it was set up, the way it was going down, boy, this was good. It, and we had some stars. I was about to say Deontay was the star of the show for me, or at least the episode for me until the end. Boy, this, I'm telling you, Peacock, they got it. This cast is perfect. The way they edit the show is perfect. The way they're doing certain things with the competitions, the missions, the killings, crazy. We're going to get into it. I'm not going to waste too much time. Please thumbs up the video. Drop your comments down below. Share the video if you can. Subscribe if you are new and let's go. All right, so we get back to Dan and Parvati and Phaedra. They're all pretty much finally meeting up. Um, Dan is pretty much telling Parvati that they was watching her all day long, trying to see how she was going to act, um, knowing that she was a traitor at that point. And they said that she did well. She was wondering how they felt she did. Um, Dan was saying the strategy behind picking her was because of her history of being ruthless and being cutthroat, which she is. We all know that if you've watched Survivor, if you didn't know that, you saw that at the end of this episode because it was great. But um, he's like... If it doesn't work out with them in terms of her being a traitor, she'll be an easy one to kind of block as a shield and like throw the, throw her out. If it comes to the point where the three of them are possibly being targeted, she's the one that they will go for first because she makes the most sense considering her track record. But now they decide who they want to murder and Parvati throws out Deontay's name, says that he can go for shields. If it's anything physical, he's a big threat to get one. And at this point, he's vulnerable because he doesn't have one. And Dan brings up Marcus. He says that he can catch on to them. He says that Marcus is very smart. Phaedra brings up that he's pretty much most valued, like as he was voted, he's, his opinion is most valued out of everybody in the house for the most part. Um, so it's a threat to them. And Parvati also brings up Larsa's built-in loyalty that he has as well. So that's a combination of a lot of things that makes Marcus a threat in this game. Um, Phaedra brings up Janelle, says Janelle, she's smart, she's a gamer, and Dan said the same thing, like, she's she's smart, and she is a gamer, he knows from Big Brother, and he said that she will cause a problem for them when it comes to that round table, which is also true, and Parvati says also that people listen to Janelle, so that's, that's another thing that you gotta worry about. Um, so they make the decision, they sign their murder, or they sign their murder over, and Alan takes the murder and hands it off to who was going to be murdered. So the next scene, we get the next morning, they get up, they go to breakfast. Um, as we all know, they all walk in. Phaedra, um, Larsa, and Max, they were the first ones to come in. Max wanted to be first because he wanted to see how everybody's acting. And I find that funny considering how everything turns out towards the end, but we'll get to it. Larsa is leaving a chair open for Marcus. She said, I want to leave one open just in case he walks in. And Phaedra's like, what you mean just in case? Like manifest it. And it's funny because Phaedra already knows he ain't walking in. But Larsa, Larsa asks who they think is in danger, and Max says Trishel, considering everything that happens. And in walks Trishel and Tamara. They're safe. Um, Max and Larsa tell her that they thought that she was gone. Trishel says she was, she thought she was gone too. Um, Trishel mentions how she wants to play a more low back, like low radar game. And she did. Like this episode, she was pretty low radar. She wasn't really a focal point. Um, but Peter and Dan, they come in next. Dan says that he slept good knowing that he had that shield, even though he knew he was a traitor. He knew he wasn't going home. But Peter said he didn't. Peter said that he, um, if he was a traitor, he would have randomized his decision making on who to murder. Uh oh, my AirPods just died. Hold on. Yeah, Peter said that he would randomize it. And with him round with him randomizing that and making that a point, Dan is looking like, okay, Peter's smart, but he just don't realize that he's sitting next to a traitor. And Peter also came alive this episode to me, too. Peter's actually a pretty strong gamer and in terms of what I can see so far, he looks like he's got a pretty decent strategy going on. But Sandra and John, they come in next. They play with John, like, who did you kill? Um, Bergie, Kevin, and Akinsu, they come in next. Akinsu, she kind of showed out this episode, too. So, like, the, the players that I thought were going to play into the background and be, like, early exits, they started to make they started to make their presence known. And Bergie did, too, honestly. But Larsa is sitting there praying. She's praying for Marcus. Like, she's like, come on, Marcus, come on in, because everybody's coming in and Marcus isn't. Sheree, MJ, and CT come in next. And Trishel sees CT and she's happy to see him. They realize now that it's down to Parvati, Janelle, Deontay, and Marcus. Those are the only four that have not walked in yet. Three are going to come in, one is not. 
Lars is getting more and more nervous. And of course, who walks in? Poverty, Janelle, and Deontay, which means Marcus was murdered. Larsa is upset. Everybody's hugging her. Poverty's playing it off like, oh shit, Marcus is the one that's gone? Knowing that she knew that he was gone, but she didn't realize. Well, I don't know if she realized that they was the last set to come in, but she definitely was playing it off. Um, all the housewives, Tamara and uh, Phaedra, were sitting there hugging uh, Larsa. They have a flashback to killing Marcus, and Dan says that he was the smartest player and he could figure them out. And Poverty was like, he got to go. And that's smart. At this point, it would make sense. I didn't like it because I wanted Marcus to play a little bit longer because I'm like, Marcus was showing signs of him being a very, very smart, calculated, logical game player. And I would have loved to see how he would play and see if he could actually get a trader out. That would be interesting. But um, Larsa, uh, Marcus said that he felt like he was too much of a threat and people were jealous of the fact that he had Larsa with him too because essentially the two of them have two people or at least a person there that they can trust fully without having any questions. Um, but they're all trying to figure out why Marcus was the one. Phaedra's playing it up. She said that she cares about a lot of them, but they got to die at the end of the day. And it's true. <laughs> like, they got to die. But Larsa says she is focused on trying to figure out who the traitors are and get them banished. Alan comes in. He's confirming that Marcus is the second faithful to be murdered. Um, he gives Larsa the picture, telling her this is how you can remember him. And Tamara cracked me up. She said, oh rest in peace, Marcus. I'm like, damn, you didn't have to say that. <laughs> like, it makes it seem like it's a little bit more real. But Alan was like, what I was like, damn, you bringing the vibe down. But Alan lets him know that they have a mission today, and the mission is actually at nighttime, so it's going to be crazy. But Larsa says that Marcus was the voice of reason, and um, that would have helped figure out who the traitors are. All right, so they disperse, and Larsa is telling Tamara they need to band together with the housewives, and they need to keep each other's back like they do on the shows, even though I was like, y'all don't really keep each other's back on the show. Let's be for real. Y'all be fighting all the time. But Trishel is asking Bergie how he felt about Marcus getting murdered. And Bergie was saying he didn't talk to him much. He don't know. Trishel says she did talk to him a lot. And he was very logical. He was very smart and gave great advice. And she feels like maybe a traitor might have been talking to him, which might have given them the inclination that, damn, he might be a little too influential and a little too smart and too logical that they might be able to figure him out. And that's exactly what happened. That's literally what happened. But, um... Parvati, John, and Akinsu, they come outside as well. And Trishel mentions, like, Dan is the possible traitor because she said he's so quiet, he's so reserved, and he's not giving out too much information. And Parvati is sitting there looking like, hmm, she ain't trying to say too much because she knows with her being the only one there, if she decides to kind of go to bat for Dan, she might put some doubts in some people's mind, like, damn, why is she going so hard for him? Are they connected? Are they actually really both traitors? Yes, they are. But Kevin... Deontay, CT, and Max, they're in another room having a conversation, and Deontay asks Max what he thinks about the murder. And Max's energy, he's Max is he just don't know how to he just don't know how to play the game, honestly. In terms of this, Max has made some very stupid, stupid mistakes and decisions in this episode itself. But he said he don't know what the motive is, and he was just watching people, and it gets awkwardly silent in this moment. And Deontay is noticing his body language. Like, Max's body language is just giving off, like, I'm very uncomfortable. And Deontay said, follow your heart, follow, and not your mind. And Max says he can't wait for the uh, roundtable discussion. The irony in that. But Larsa, Phaedra, Janelle, Dan, Sheree, Sandra, and Deontay, they are in another room having another conversation. And Janelle is saying that she does not feel like a woman would want to get rid of a man, which would be Marcus or Bananas. So Lars is asking Dan now, what do you think? And this is the first time Dan's opinion's been asked in this moment. And we all know Larsa, Larsa, Larsa came alive too. Larsa's been alive, but she really came alive this episode in terms of a game, a game player strategy. Um, but Dan said that he's an action person. He don't go off vibes. He goes off actions. And he was hoping that there was going to be like some inclination into the murders um, to see what type of motive it might be, but he hadn't seen anything yet. Dan was pretty coy. He didn't say too much. And Lars is thinking it's a man that is a traitor and said that they have to hone in on the men. And Dan said Lars is giving him the, the evil eyes and giving him bad vibes, so he's watching her, and he knows that she's watching him. <laughs> but it's nighttime, and they head off to the mission. They get to the mission. It's a graveyard site, essentially. It's very creepy, very ory, and just like... It's something that if you if you don't like horror films, which I do, if you don't like horror films, you would be creeped out going out there. But Larsa, she notices Marcus's grave is out there. Alan comes out and lets him know their mission is to find golden hidden, um, find gold hidden in the graves. There's tombs back there as well. 
their gold in there as well. Um, they will need to get tools to um, get into the cemetery to go ahead and get the rest of the gold out. And he said, once the gold is dug up, bring it to him, bring it to the barrel, drop it in there. Um, in some of the graves, there are some shields. And if any player gets caught in a beam, they have beams of light that are shining down on them as they're running out. If you get caught in it, you are eliminated immediately with whatever you have in your hand. Um, and half will start in the cemetery and then they'll substitute people out once people get eliminated. So then they have to decide who are the first nine to go out. And the first nine to go out are MJ Parvati, Peter, Bergy, Sandra, Trishel, Dan, Akinsu, and John. The substitutes are going to be Sheree, Max, Janelle, Phaedra, CT, Larsa, Kevin, Tamara, and Deontay. Janelle made it a point to say she wanted to go second because she wanted to see how the game was being played and figure out how she's going to do it, which I would have done the same thing. So MJ is wanting to show her worth in this challenge because she felt like she couldn't really show it the last challenge due to her height. But the challenge begins. They got 20 minutes. They get to running out trying to find things, but to avoid the light. John is the first one. Gets caught in the light. Eliminated immediately. CT volunteers to go in and replace John. He goes out there. The time starts back. They got 17 minutes left. Nobody has found the tools yet. CT sees a hammer. He grabs it, starts hammering away. CT ends up getting caught in the light. He's eliminated. He's frustrated because he knows that he expects a lot out of himself when it comes to challenges, considering his background. And he felt like he was careless when it happened. So MJ comes in and gets eliminated. Deontay replaces her. Trishel then gets eliminated. Larsa replaces her. Poverty gets eliminated. Deontay's eliminated. He's pissed the fuck off. <laughs> He's out pissed the fuck off. And six players end up um, getting eliminated with three subs left with no money. At this point, they ain't got no money. No money. 12 minutes. They don't win eight minutes without getting any money. Six players gone. So they know that they have to communicate now. And Bergy is trying to spout out strategy. And it's just not working because he's not being assertive enough. Bergy, you got to use your mouth. Bergy, we know how Bergy is if you watch Love and Island. He's very awkward. Um, and I'll say it, socially awkward. I don't want to say he's an awkward person, but he's socially awkward. And I would say he lacks a little bit of confidence. Like, in terms of his voice, he doesn't really have as much confidence behind it, which... Hopefully, I feel like he's starting to get it now on the show, which I was skeptical. I will admit, I was skeptical about him being on the show whenever I saw the cast. I'm like, why the fuck is he here? Like, out of all the people that are here, you got Bergy, and Bergy just doesn't make sense, essentially. Because all the rest of these people here are, like, reality star titans. And you got people like Deontay Wilder, world champion boxer, like, certain people like that, and Michael Jordan, his son. Like, that stuff just didn't make sense to me. But Bergy... We don't get to him. He started to come alive. Sheree gets eliminated. Phaedra goes in. She's the last one to go in. Sandra ends up getting eliminated. Bergy, um, like I said, he's got some strategy, and people are starting to realize that he has one, but he's just lacking the assertiveness to get them to listen. So 10 minutes are left, and they, think they ain't got no money. Dan takes it upon himself to pretty much let everybody know, listen to Bergy. He's got a strategy. Bergy finally gets their attention, and Kevin, Kevin is the last substitute to come in, not Phaedra. He comes in, Bergy is now telling them where to go. Like, the lights are coming at this point. When the lights come, you go this way. Do this, pay attention to the pattern. And it starts working. They start grabbing the coins. Bergy has, he's like having a moment where he's feeling like, damn, I'm actually doing something. I'm getting to prove myself. And um, everybody's impressed with him too. That's the thing. A lot of people that are watching it go down, everybody that's out there are impressed with what he's doing because it's working. It's getting them the money, and they're avoiding getting eliminated. They got 5K in the pot, five minutes left. Tamara is trying to get the shield. Tamara's like, okay, we're getting this money, so it's time for me to find a way to make sure I'm safe. So she's happy. She ends up going and getting the shield. Um, there's more and more money piling up. They got four minutes left, and they still grabbing the money. Bergy ends up getting caught in the light, and everyone's like, damn, no, not Bergy, but they all like high-fived him. They cheered him on when he got out. Um, because they're happy. I mean, he helped them get a lot of money. They helped, he pretty much made them make some progress and it was good. Bergy's happy because he finally feels like he proved his worth in the game. He's looking good in the eyes of everybody else. So essentially Bergy's not somebody that people are going to want to get out, at least not at this moment. Um, Peter, he then says, I'm about to go get me a shield. So he goes and gets one. Janelle, Janelle has a very, very, it's funny because it kind of redo. It, it was like a redo of what happened on Big Brother All Star season seven. You ain't watched that season. You gotta go watch it. Janelle was showing out on that season, but this is literally what happened in her veto competition where 
I want to say it was final six where she was about to go home and she needed that veto to make sure that she wasn't going home and she got it. The same thing kind of happened. Janelle ends up looking for her shield. She ends up going and I think Peter was the one that was hammering it down. And what Janelle was saying was true. This did happen the way it happened. J um, Peter's hammering away and Janelle ends up snatching the shield, trying to get the shield out to go ahead and take it. Akinsu comes up because she's trying to get a shield too. So she tries to snatch the shield from Janelle and they toggling with it at this point. Janelle is like, uh-uh, this ain't happening again. Like Janelle was trying to recreate that Big Brother 7 moment with the video. She snatched that shield from Akinsu and got it. And keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that. That's a big storyline later on. Um, but they added $19,500 to the pot when the game was done. So they made some money. They made some money. They're all excited. Three shields have been won. As we said, Tamara, Janelle, and Peter, they have gotten their shields, so they're safe. Akinsu is in the car. She's telling Dan and a couple other people, I forget who else was in there, but she hates bitchy girls, and she feels like Janelle is a bitchy girl, and she snatched the shield from her. She's kind of playing it up. Larsa is saying that Janelle is selfish for snatching that shield from her. And Janelle is in the other car with Tamara in them. And Janelle's pretty much saying that Kensu was doing too much because she didn't even touch her. And Tamara said, address it then. Like, if that's the case, then address it. And Janelle said, if she's talking some shit, I will. Janelle will. And it is funny. But they get back to the house. Um, Akinsu, she's asking everybody if they could banish one person, who would they do? And MJ said, Dan. Traitor. And she said in front of Kevin, Max, Larsa, and Bergie. And she said it's because he's too quiet. He does not say anything. He's not giving out too much information. He's not really saying anything. And MJ says she wants to put him in the hot seat and have him plead his case and see how he acts. And Max ends up walking away from this. Max is st This is where Max starts making dumb decisions. Max walks away from eavesdropping into this room and goes into the next room, which has CT, Gamer. Dan, gamer. Peter, showing that he's a gamer. Sandra, gamer. Poverty, gamer. Deontay, who later on shows that he's a gamer with strategy. All these gamers in one room, they're talking strategy about the round table and how they want to approach it. Max is walking in, like peeping in. And CT's like, come on in, come on in. Max backs it on up and walks out. I'm like, why the fuck would you do that? Why would you do that? You go sit in there, even if you don't want to be in there, you go sit in there and act like you want to hear what they got to say. And you try to act like you're trying to contribute to conversations to keep the heat off of you. You making yourself look suspect, walking in and out of rooms, and he don't even realize it. A lot of these people in this room are already suspicious of him anyways, AKA Deontay and CT. And the minute he walks out, CT tells, um, well, he's pretty much, because Max is walking around talking to whoever he was talking to. I forget who it was. And he's like, where's Janelle? Deontay immediately starts talking about Max. He says at breakfast when Marcus wasn't there, Max did not look surprised. It was like, the way he was looking was like, I just knew he wasn't coming in here. We get the next scene, Kevin and Peter, they're talking. And Kevin thinks that Janelle could be a traitor. And Peter's like, no, she's too aggressively trying to get these shields to be a traitor. And at this point, I see where he's coming from with that. Because it's like... I can see you doing it one time if you're a traitor to kind of like defer from it, but getting them every time, you just seem like you're just trying to make sure that you're safe. And I see where he's coming from, and he's right. But Peter said that they need to stick together, but what they need to do is act like they're not each other's biggest fans, which is AKA don't try to always be together, which what they do later on was not smart in my opinion, because it just came out of left field, but we'll talk about it. But Kevin says if the traitors see them going after each other, they're going to keep them around, which also makes sense too. But Parvati ends up pulling Dan to the side because his name is floating around and Dan is asking who is saying his name. And Parvati's like, honestly, it's a bunch of people. Like, you're too quiet. And they don't want to hang out in that room too long by themselves. So they immediately disperse. And Dan is now nervous. He's like, damn, okay. I got to figure it out now. So the next scene, they head to the round table. This is where it all gets juicy. And I, the round tables this season has already been eating it up. They were good last season, but this every single round table has been juicy. There's been like at least two or three different fights. Not even fights, but just heated arguments and exchange happening. Um, but Dan is expecting the heat. He's going in here expecting it. He's like, the minute that happens, I'm going to just be focused on trying to have a great defense and keeping a good poker face and making sure I'm as poised as possible to make it not look like I'm suspicious. I'm not, I'm not truthful in what I'm saying. So he's preparing himself for it. Um, Alan ends up coming in, and they begin. 
Bergie starts it off. I'm like, okay, Bergie, you start another conversation. It's interesting. And he said he's heard a lot of people saying Dan's name today, so he should speak about it. And it's like, okay, shit, Dan, you done got it already. <laughs> Here it comes. So Dan says he's 1,000% of faithful. He said he knows he's quiet. He takes um, It takes him a while to open up to people. And when um, he says the name, he wants him to know that it's really coming from, okay, Dan is taking a shot. Like, Dan is confident in this. And he said he doesn't want to have another peppermint situation happen. And some people was like, okay. But some people was not. Because MJ immediately jumped in and said, okay, if we all played the game like you was and have you have, have if we all played the game the way you have and have been now, there will be no game. There will be no game conversation happening. Um, and she said, like this low radar game is not what we need to see. You playing it a little too safe. And she clocked his game strategy. She did. Like she generally, it's like she genuinely did. But um, she said it's too safe to be flying below the radar. And Deontay feels like, because he jumped to Dan's defense, he said like, and I feel like Deontay did this because he doesn't want, as we saw last week or in the last episode the herd mentality. He doesn't want that to end up happening. So he's like, um, he feels like Dan is a faithful and he doesn't want people to confuse his personality for being a traitor. He said, that's just who he is. And he says, um, certain people switched up the moment he builds this up. He says, certain people switched up the moment that he met them. And he said, this man is charming. He's intelligent. He's got a poker face. And I'm talking about you, Max. He built that shit up so good. It was so intense. <laughs> and Max is like, oh shit. Like his face is like, oh shit. He said the way that he moves, he smiles, and the way he speaks is like giving traitor. He said he's a leader, he's a shot caller. And he said that impression that he gave when Marcus walked in the room was like, I wouldn't expect you to walk in this room because I already knew you wasn't coming in this room. He said that shit was fake, and he knew he wasn't coming in. Sandra jumps in immediately and says, okay, the day Peppermint got banished, she was looking around the table, and everybody else was serious, and Max was sitting there with his hand over his face and started laughing. And she was like... Can you explain that? Max said he's uncomfortable defending himself. And he looked uncomfortable defending himself. But he said um, he had a great time in the moment and he just had a natural reaction. And sometimes I, in situations like this, on a show like this, I probably would have the same situation on me because I laugh in uncomfortable situations. So if somebody's crying or somebody might die, not me, I'm not laughing because it's funny. It's just I, when I'm uncomfortable, I do laugh sometimes. So I understand where he's coming from with this, but in a game like this, you can't be doing it. But he said that he wants to uh, continue to keep playing this dropping names game. And he then brings up Janelle and Akinsu situation. So he's trying to take the heat off of them, take the heat off of him and put it on them. He said, can y'all clear that up? So then we get to these two. And Akinsu's saying, okay, it's simple. Like the shield was there. She grabbed it. And Janelle kind of barged on her and ran off. And Janelle said, that's not how it happened. It's not true. She says she was there before you. Like she said, I was there before you and you came in and pretty much tried to get it off of me. And that's what it was. And I snatched it back because I'm I'm here first. And essentially that was what happened, honestly. But Akinsu's doing what she needs to do to make sure that Janelle is looking like a selfish player because Janelle already kind of made herself look selfish in the first episode when she went charging for that uh, shield the first time. And everybody, all, everybody else is already looking at her that way anyway, so why not play it up? Um... But she said, that's fine. Like she said, I'll take the shield. And she clocked how Max was deflecting the heat. She said, it's kind of interesting how you're now trying to put this situation over the shit that you did because you want to get the heat off of you. And Max is like, no, it's us to continue to keep talking over people because she was talking over him while he was trying to speak. And the she said, maybe blinking and uh, blinking and breathing the suspect too. And they were just going back and forth throwing shots. And I was like, damn, she's kind of shut him down too. And she kind of shut down Janelle too because Janelle kind of backed off a little bit. But CT mentions how Max is deflecting as well. And he says it's kind of giving traitor. He said he's not accusing him, but that's just his thought process. Max says, okay, well, that's a great strategy because he's been thinking about you too, CT. He said because the first day, the first person that you said that you would get was Bananas, and Bananas is gone. And CT was like, wait, hold up. The minute the minute you brought that up, like, I brought that up trying to have conversation with you, and the minute you bring it up, it's making it seem like you're a traitor at this point. Deontay then jumps in and says, Max, you trying to defend yourself a little too hard. Like your body language is giving nervous energy. Like Deontay is kind of like trying to antagonize him without antagonizing him. So Deontay tells the faithfuls to open their hearts. And he says, don't follow the herd. Y'all going to do it, but don't do it. Because if you make the mistakes, you go back to their room, you're going to be feeling shitty. 
the way that you did before. And he's pretty much he's pretty much speaking what he literally said, how he felt um, the last episode when Peppermint went home. So Deontay is standing on business. He said he didn't want to do it, and he is not doing it. So um, he said, at some point, you just got to be the leader. You can't be the follower all the time. So Larsa. Larsa says that um, they need to hone in on a better strategy. And Deontay says, who are you feeling? She says, Dan. She said his energy, like the energy he gives is getting her uneasy. His demeanor is too calm and he's a gamer. He's played these games. Max is not a gamer. And Max starts chuckling because she's low-key getting the heat off of him. Larsa thinks it's Dan. Dan says that he could do better with talking and that's his personality. Alan says to let them know it's time to vote. Dan's noticing MJ and Larsa, they still on him. They're not giving him any inclination that their mind might have changed. Parvati's not ready to turn on Dan because it's not going to look good for her. And she ends up going for Kevin. So the votes are revealed. Sheree uh, votes for Janelle, who I thought was funny because she has a shield. Bergie votes Max. MJ votes uh, Dan. Phaedra votes Akinsu. Sandra votes Max. Peter votes Kevin. Everybody's looking confused. John votes Max. Janelle votes Max. Akinsu, uh, who did Akinsu vote? Akinsu voted Max. No, Max votes Akinsu. Larsa votes Dan. Poverty votes Kevin. It's so many different votes, which I like because it's not like everybody's making their own moves. Kevin voted Peter. Um, Trishelle voted Max. Deontay voted, uh, pushes, he said, pushing it to the max. <laughs> That's who he voted Max. And then uh, Akinsu voted Max. Dan voted Max. Tamara voted Max. CT also voted Max. And Max gets up and lets him know straight to the case. He just got straight to the chase and was like, look, I'm not doing the long speech. I'm a faithful. They shook. Dan's playing it off. Janelle is now pissed. Larsa said, I already knew it. I told y'all. And Larsa says, just because somebody's quirky and laughs does not mean that you got to do that. You got to dig a little deeper. And MJ is saying that Deontay and Sandra are too influential and they got to start paying more attention before knocking off faithfuls as they've done. So they disperse. I'm trying to speak fast because I only got 10% left on this on this camera, on this damn uh, computer. Janelle and Sandra, they're talking about how Deontay influenced their decisions. Um, Akinsu, Phaedra, Tamara, Kevin, John, they're all trying to come up with strategy. And Deontay is sitting there. He's just, he's upset. Like, he's upset that another situation where a faithful has gone and he's feeling bad. He's beating himself up. They're trying to get him up to speed and, like, lift up his spirits. So the traders get a note. If they're having a secret meeting, they're not having a secret meeting this time to kill somebody. They have to murder in plain sight. But the thing is, they have to go into a library and get these three, um, go through these three Shakespeare tragedies to find a poison chalice, which is like a drink cup. And they have to make somebody drink it. And the person that drinks it gets murdered. So they don't know, they don't know how they're going to do it. So they're trying to figure it out. So uh, Dan and Parvati, they go and meet in a room and Bergie's walking by and everybody's walking by and they're trying to make it as concise as possible because it's hard to meet in public now. And they pretty much are trying to figure out, okay, MJ. MJ might be the one, but Dan's like, it might be too obvious. Dan throws out Sheree. Parvati's like, well, Phaedra would never let that happen. And then they throw out John. So it's between John, Sheree, and MJ. Parvati says, okay, you go help. Like, go help me find this chalice, and then I'll go do it. Parvati was giving, like, Angelina Jolie from Salt this whole last part. This is why I was like, Parvati is the star of this right now. She went sneaking around the way she was so stealth with it. She was just, like, ruthless. So Phaedra um, says she's going to leave it to Dan and Poverty because she don't hang out with them like that. And it doesn't make sense for them to be like trying to be around each other, trying to figure out how it's going to happen. And she just hopes it doesn't bite her in the ass. Dan goes into a library. He gets the child. He's trying to get the challenge. And CT and Kevin are walking by. Poverty's walking by just scoping the scene, looking so salt like. And she goes in and grabs it. She gets it. And Poverty got it. So she goes into the bar trying to act like a bartender. And John and Sheree are in there. She's trying to figure out who she wants to do between the two of them. And Phaedra is sitting right next to uh, Sheree. Phaedra notices that she's putting the chalice in front of Sheree. And she's like, uh-uh, that's not about to happen on my watch. I know it's a game, but you're not about to kill her on my watch. Parvati then realizes, okay, she's too connected with Phaedra. I'm not going to do it. So she avoids missing. She goes into another room. She's standing there next to MJ, who is drinking out of a cup. Dan is in there. Janelle is right next to MJ. Peter's asking, who's getting murdered tonight? And the kids who's like, no, not me. And then MJ's like, you too pretty to die. While she's sitting next to somebody who's trying to murder her, aka Parvati. And while they're trying to figure it out, she's still sitting there drinking. And Parvati's trying to put the drink next to her, trying to figure out what's happening. And she cannot do it. So she's like, you know what? I know who I'm going to get. And I think she's going to get Janelle. It was a cliffhanger. The way she went around it was so stealth. I'm like, damn, she's about to get her. 
But we about to see. I did it. I got it. I only got like five seconds left on this battery. But I did it. Thumbs up the video. Drop your comments down below. This episode was fan-fucking-tastic. It was one of the best episodes of reality TV for me. I'm saying it. The last 10 minutes was too good. I wish I could have had more battery on this freaking computer to really elaborate a little more. But poverty was like a stone-cold killer trying to get somebody. But it's exciting. I'm excited to see what it's going to be like on um, Friday. It might be Friday night when I drop it. But yeah, I'll see y'all then. Please thumbs up the video, drop your comments, subscribe, share, and I'll see y'all then. Peace.